is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 78 and 79. In these episodes, Nami gets really sick, and it seems like it's due to weird weather patterns. And also, we get to see some of an upcoming villain who I think is Mr. Two. And I think Mr. Two might be wearing a tutu. I really hope he is. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Bernadette for commissioning this episode. Um, so this, these two episodes, it was sort of a weird thing because I don't feel like the show does this that often, but it began by wrapping up the previous episode, kind of. And considering that these are meant to be like two totally separate seasons, that's extra weird. Um, because it only is about five or six minutes of the, the first of these two episodes. So I really feel like probably they could have cut some things in the previous episodes and still fit this in. And it would have felt a little bit tidier. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it is the sort of thing that always makes me wonder what the showrunners were thinking when they did it. Like, why was there a purpose to it? Did they just not know how they were going to end the story? Or did they not intend to share this information and then realize, like, well, I, people are wondering what, you know, like, and I'm assuming a lot of it is based on how the mango's written. But I don't know. I don't know if this, you know, is how it went there either. Like, did one of the uh, the issues end sort of mid story and the other began with finishing it off. Um, I just, yeah, I'm just curious about, because like this starts off with a sort of flashback look at what was going on between Broggy and Dory. Is that his name? I always get their names messed up. Um, and honestly, I don't feel like we really needed to know this. However, it was fun. I'm not mad at it. It's just a surprising thing that they took time off the start of the next episode to explain it. Like they seem to be really like, no, but you guys really need to know the backstory. And what it turns out is going on is that the two of them like straight up don't remember why they're fighting. We knew that. And we get um, a look at the fact that both of them were like the leaders of these uh, two factions or were they were they leaders or were they the guys that were talking to each other in the bar? Uh, I say bar, but it's like they were both drinking, but they're so much younger and smaller in that that I assumed they were the leaders and those guys were just like their dudes who are subordinates. I'm realizing that I may have that wrong. Um, and yeah, they're talking about how each of them like landed a, uh, what are they called? Kingfish. And essentially what's going on between the two of them is the same thing that's going on between Zoro and Sanji, where they get completely caught up in which one of them like got the biggest of the, f the two fish. And they're not fish though. They're like, because they, their heads almost look like alligator heads. Uh, sea King. Thank you, Florian. So, yeah, they get asked by a little girl which one's the bigger one. And both of them claim to have the bigger one. And then they begin to duel over it. And then that just continues for ages. And that explains why. Because I kept saying that these, like, the hills on the island look like bones, you know, it, I didn't think they were skulls. I thought that they were like rib cages or something, but the, clearly they were bones and I didn't really understand that. Um, 
guys, can you, can anyone explain to me what the deal was with that tiger that looks like it got cut up and then just collapses? Is that, is that still something that you can't tell me about? Or is that, y'all know what I'm talking about. The part where I thought the tiger got attacked by a dinosaur, but then when I rewatched it, that's not what happened at all. It just looks like a slice shows up and there's like blood spatter and the tiger collapses and we see nothing. Like there's no particular attack. Is that something you are allowed to tell me? Should I have known what that... Just tell me if I'm supposed to have known what that was about. You could just tell me that. Because I'm, I, I keep thinking about it and I sort of wondered in this flashback if we were going to get some of that information. It doesn't seem like it. Um, let's see. Uh, Gus says, it's just meant to show you that the king of the jungle is relatively weak on Little Garden. I mean... A, a, an attack from a dinosaur would do that. Like it, co it gets cut out of nowhere. It's like there is an invisible man standing next to it with a, with a sword. So it just doesn't make any sense. And considering how this show tends to operate, when I say it doesn't make any sense, that's really something, you know, this is like, and a lot of things, they turn around and wind up having an explanation in the end. Like the one that I keep thinking about that I really thought was so satisfying was uh, Kuro and how he like adjusted his glasses with the weird like palm of his hand. And then we find out it's because he used to have fucking knife fingers. And I'm like, oh, wow, that makes complete sense. Um, but yeah, uh, Gus says it died of its wounds. It was already injured, I think. Oh, wow. Okay, that's super unclear. All right, I will accept it, but they're on notice for that. So <laughs> Florian says, not to be the one, but just forget about the tiger. <laughs> okay, I just, I felt like that was supposed to really like signal a particular type of bad guy and it just didn't. So I, I was like, not sure if, because, you know, we see these two giants attack this giant goldfish with these weapons that like cut the actual ocean. So I sort of was like, is that supposed to be that they like can cut this lot, this tiger from afar in the jungle, you know? Anyway. Um, so yeah, they're still like battling over like who has the biggest of these two sea kings when they finish attacking this goldfish, each of their weapons breaks. And I guess that was what was supposed to, because like I mentioned at the end of the last episode, how they behave as if deciding to go up against this goldfish means their own certain death. And I thought that was odd. And I guess it means they're saying goodbye to these weapons that they've relied on for such a long time. They are continuing to, to fight though unless i am mistaken because there is the sound of like a uh uh the what do you call it call to battle that they always obey and they just like get up and head back in like all right here we go so i am assuming now it's going to be either fisticuffs or one of them can be blacksmith i don't know but that's it ends letting us know that those two are going to they're still alive and they are going to continue doing their thing. Um, so when we go to the ship itself, these, th nobody seems to notice what bad shape Nami is in. It's really rough. I don't like watching her be sick. I feel like the, the animators do too good a job at having her look exhausted there's just this heaviness to the way that she's drawn and i was like feeling it considering i'm also extremely tired lately it just i was like oh girl i feel you and later later on when her fever starts to get really bad and she's like breathing hard the um voice actor does a really good job of that like heavy kind of panting breath 
And that's a hard thing to do because sometimes people will, you know, voice actors try to do that and it comes across weirdly either sexual or just forced, almost like they're imitating a dog, you know, like the <laughs> that kind of thing. And with the voice actress for Nami, I just kept being like, oh, the poor thing. Look how bad it is. <laughs> like She just genuinely got me. Um, Florian asks if I think I will see uh, Bragi and Dory again. I think so, because we, it, it w I don't feel like we'd be told explicitly that they're still alive unless the, it's being set up that they're going to show up again. But I don't know how that would happen, you know? Um, this show doesn't tend to say goodbye to characters unless they're actually killed. They just bring them back, you know, at some point. They all, they always seem to turn up again. And if if they haven't by now, I expect that they will, you know. Um, so, <laughs> guys... There, there's so there's so much about the Nami is sick thing that gets to me. So I want to I want to preface this by saying it's not even that bad for me because I don't have children. However, I have mentioned before how Luffy gets called the captain and Nami is clearly the one that's actually in charge. Like Luffy is their number one fighter. And he's certainly the heart of the crew in many ways because he made this happen. But Nami is the captain. Like, come on. And I, in my household, am the one that tends to be in charge of a lot of things. And thus, when I get sick, it just feels like absolutely everything in the house comes grinding to a halt. Dishes don't get washed. Laundry doesn't get done. Nothing gets picked up. Everything that I do, one would hope Owen would pick it up while I'm ill, doesn't really happen. And I'm not even like that mad at him for that because it's really hard when you're in a routine to suddenly begin doing the things that you don't usually do, like to keep it in mind that they still need doing. But it can be very discouraging if you get sick to come off of that illness and be faced with this like pile of chores that just backed up while you were down for the count. And when I say like, I'm not a mom, so it's not as bad. I fully fucking mean that because I don't know how moms do it when they're sick. I mean, I, I just, I genuinely don't like you have to keep, you have to keep the household going enough to keep your children alive and fed especially women who don't have a partner in the picture at all. But even women who do have a partner in the picture, I hate to say this, but like 95% of those relationships, a woman does everything for the dude as well. So he just winds up acting like another child that she has to take care of and thus is not really much of a help when it comes down to it. And I'm just calling it like I sees it and like I hears it from my friends. And Nami getting ill, going down for the count, trying to like be brave and go like act like she's okay. She finally does let herself lay down. And what happens? They fucking ignore the log pose and just start going in the fucking wrong direction because nobody is listening to what she says or paying attention. Oh my God. That is the fucking truest thing. I was so annoyed with her and I was so extra mad that it was fucking Zorro. He is supposed to be the one that has some sense. You know, come on, man. Like I would have been, if I were going to give anybody the pose to navigate, I would have given it to Vivi because honestly, I don't really trust any of the dudes like in general, but if Vivi wasn't there, I'd pick Zorro and I would assume that he would be up for it. And he just drops the ball so completely here. And I was just so disgusted. And her frustration and him being like, you really need to go back, like lay back down again. And she's like, oh, do I? How am I supposed to fucking do that? Considering that you just like led us towards a storm. Why would I? Why would I? No. Oh, yep. That's where you wind up. Where it's like I could either rest or I could keep us from like running aground on a bunch of rocks and that feels like what's going on with so many women out there and it's just 
I don't know how y'all do it. I have a, a tiny household of two people and I'm so tired so much of the time. If you've got children, just you need so much credit. You just do. So pat yourself on the back and give yourself a hug and be like, I deserve more credit. Say it to yourself in the mirror every day because you do. So anyway, then, you know, that's part of why Nami getting sick hit me so hard as well, just because she is the one that I always look to to have some common sense in situations and her getting sort of taken out of the equation in this way. It's one thing for her to get sidelined in a physical way. You know, because she's not that much of a fighter. It's not like she doesn't put up fights in her way, but it's, you know what I mean? She's not like a combat character. So if she's sidelined in, oh, like, getting trapped somewhere or whatever, that doesn't feel as dangerous to me because she's smart. And I know that she could figure something out with her mind a lot of the time. But when it's, she's getting put in a position where just, like, thinking is is too much, she's too tired for that. Oh, that feels like it's threatening in a way that I do not care for. Um, so she is uh, hanging out with Vivi. We have a moment where Vivi remembers. Um, what is the guy's name with the uh, Mr. Cogsworth? And he is telling her that basically the future of her entire country relies on her survival. And that if she dies, then everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket. So she really just has to be extra sure that she doesn't die. He's very insistent on this. And it's one of those things where uh, it's like our, everybody tends to have a lot of uh, self-preservation anyway. We have that built in. But when you've got so many people relying on you and later on Luffy brings this up, he's just like, he says something like millions of people and there's just like, oh my God, that is, that is too much. No wonder you're so worried. Um, Sanji comes out and he's got like this whole, this tray of like hors d'oeuvres that he is sharing with the two of them. And when both Luffy and Usopp look over and they like want some and get irritated, like where's ours? He tells them theirs is in the kitchen in this voice. And then later on, he tells them that basically uh, he makes like the best of all of the food they have for Nami and Vivi. And he gives anything that's rotting to Usopp and Luffy. And I don't know why that got me so hard, but I fell out laughing. I just there was something about him just saying that in this matter of fact, like, well, what do you guys expect sort of way? I was cracking up. And then like, Usopp, of course, is like, what the fuck, man? And Luffy is just like, oh, I don't care. It tastes good anyway. I don't even notice. You know, I, Luffy, very practical minded. He's like, as long as I can't tell it's rotten, what do I care? I, I, I'm not sick. It tastes delicious. I feel like this is a win. It's fine. Um, so they are, they're like indulging in their little uh, snacks and drinks and whatnot Meanwhile, fucking Zoro is out here. I really want to know like where he got these weights from, but he is doing some strength training. Uh, he's on like the 2600th rep. First of all, Zoro is Bay. We know this. And he has like these giant plates on this what looks sort of like a barbell but he's only got the weights on one side because he's swinging the the bar as if it is a sword and berating himself for not having been strong enough to cut them out of the like wax work that they were all stuck in and this is one of those where I'm like I feel really bad because like that wax was meant to be as strong as steel can he cut through steel? Like, is that even on you? You know, I understand him internalizing this and deciding there's nothing like reasserting control over things. Right. And I completely see how being stuck in his uh, position where he feels like everybody is depending on him. I could really understand how the one thing he can tell himself is 
if I get strong enough, I can keep this from happening again. Because that's very comforting, you know, and and God knows that's like my go to move. Anytime something goes wrong, I try to figure out how I can keep that from happening in the future. And before I even do a thing, I try and anticipate every possible contingency because I just, it makes me feel more comforted to know that I have a million plans in place to handle it. But I just don't think it's uh, his fault that they couldn't get out. Like, most blades aren't going to be able to cut through steel, just period. So unless he intended to just break out of steel with his bare muscles, even the giant has trouble with that, you know? I, Zoro, I just feel like you're just taking too much on yourself, buddy. You need to be easier on yourself. But that is not his way. So then we cut to the little teaser. I don't know what this is. <sighs> so there's this uh, dude who is wearing, we, we see that he is certainly wearing toe shoes. And he seems to be wearing a long sort of like pink bathrobe with feathers around the wrists and a sort of like swan headdress around like that comes up the back of his uh, uh, the robe and the front of the ship has a swan figurehead as well. Let me not leave that out. So... <laughs> This guy is like Swan Lake themed ballet. The I don't know what devil fruit he could have eaten. Like you guys, I already talked about how the devil fruit powers just fall completely outside of the superpower parameters that I'm familiar with. I want so much to be creative enough to come up with something that feels like it would fit this guy. I don't know what that is. Like, does he just dance and, and that's his like fighting style and he can like just dance the fuck out of that's not, is that a superpower? Like, I don't even know if what, and, and I say that, but like sometimes things don't have anything to do with the devil fruit power. Like Buggy is a clown but his power is that he gets chopped into pieces and then can reassemble. That's nothing to do with being a clown. That's not related. Those things aren't, you know, caused by one another. He already looked like that before he even ate the fruit. So I'm trying to think up a power for this guy that has to do with his costume. And for all I know, the costume came first. I don't even know. Um, I think that I'm just getting wrapped up in something like Mr. Smoker, Captain Smoker, because, you know, he his power and how he dresses and looks are very related to one another but uh that doesn't tend to be the case so this dude and he tells his whole crew um to that mr 3 is uh some like garbage i think he calls him heavy garbage something like that um and Oh, the Swanda is ready to to set sail. I forgot that that's the name of the ship. Uh, why do I have to do this? Mr. Three is nothing but bulky garbage. You guys go toss him out. And these dudes say, we definitely can't do that because he is way more powerful than any of us. It's the boss's orders also. And this dude comes towards them saying, Un, deux, trois which is the count when you're doing ballet, when you're doing like, you know, just your exercises to warm up, which uh, I just can't get over the weirdness of all of these. Like, <sighs> so he comes towards them and says, what's four called? And he has these pom poms on his head as well. And he's definitely wearing lipstick. Um, and he says, zero Chan is so high maintenance. And then it cuts away. And that's all we get to see. I am dying. I really, really want to see this guy. And I am very into what clearly seems coded as a masculine character wearing what would be considered women's clothing. 
because apparently this person is going to be a threatening badass and I'm very interested. I hope that's the case. They all seem very afraid of him. They're more afraid of Mr. Zero, but nevertheless. Um, so we cut back to the ship and this is when Nami passes out. They bring her to bed and Vivi explains that what's going on with the, uh, with the weather might be what is affecting her, that there are really strange weather patterns due to the islands, each having their own sort of isolated, like climate. And because they all have these separate climates, they clash against each other and it makes the areas between the islands really, really like unpredictable and temperamental. So when the weather begins to sort of like soften and grow more consistent, that usually signals that you are approaching an island that has a particular climate and you're settling into that climate because you're closing in on it, Um, which is a really weird idea. I am, I'm here for it, especially, (laughs) so uh, those of you who play Animal Crossing, um, there was an update last week. And uh, one of the new things that you can do is there's this little like turtle guy who, or he's a frog maybe with like a turtle shell shaped backpack. It's unclear. He, you can go and like ride this little dinghy, this like motorboat, and he will take you to different islands than you usually go to. Normally when you like fly to visit somewhere, they just bring you to another like, you know, beautiful summer island and it feels like eternal, you know, like the the Caribbean, like the Bahamas somewhere. But this other guy, when you ride with him, he takes you to places that are completely different seasons. And so you can wind up, even though it's the middle of summer, you can wind up visiting a snowy island. Yesterday I visited a spring island that was covered in uh, cherry blossom trees. So this just kept reminding me of Animal Crossing. And eventually, like, she shows the actual, like, illustrations. I say she shows as if Vivi is holding up these little placards, but there is an animation of the this tree in different seasons to explain the climates and the way they go. And she does make sure to be like, there are lots of exceptions in here. And I was like, of course there are. We can't tie ourselves into a single pattern of this show. Are you kidding me? Um, but this, like, this seems, I was of the mind initially, okay, this is a weird thing because, and and I'm sure you guys have had this sort of thing said to you by older relatives and stuff. And I'm not even trying to say it's wholly untrue, but I don't think it deserves the kind of uh, the credit it gets. And that is blaming your health on the weather. And I say this, like, no, acknowledging, like, there are, like, certain people react really badly to dampness. Um, It's not like being out in extreme cold can't hurt you. I'm not trying to say weather has no effect on our health, but... There there will be, like, people who blame the fact that you have a cold on the fact that you got caught in the rain. And that's one of those that I'm always just like, what? What is this, the relation between those things in their mind? Like, that just doesn't, that's never really made sense to me. I guess if it's supposed to be, like, you, it was also cold outside and you, like, caught a chill, as they say. Um, but it is just something that is often tossed out there. My father, whenever it was like cold and windy, he would get absolutely fucking militant about me covering my ears. It was like, he really thought that the wind carried illness. And if I left the openings in my head uh, open and uncovered, that it would just slip right in there and drop off the little luggage of disease. And then it would be all over for me. But as long as I covered my ears, then it couldn't get me. That was like really the vibe he had. And here I was like, oh God, are we just going to do the like weather makes you sick thing? Or, 
And I wouldn't even have been mad about that because the show does all kinds of stuff that just is, we take it for granted because it's a cartoon in a lot of ways. You know, we just do the thing that we've been taught and take as a trope because that works for this story. But later on, Vivi says something about how uh, Nami seems to be able to tell what's going to happen with the weather long before the weather is showing any sign of going bad. You know, she is aware that there's going to be a storm in a certain direction and manages to like help them get out of it just in time. And Vivi is the one who's just like, that's not exactly like the, yeah, she's an amazing navigator, but that's not really what navigating is. And how could she have known that? It's like, she can just tell and so I'm kind of wondering if the uh, weather thing, it's meant to be like somehow Nami is tied in with the weather and maybe there is a different effect for her specifically than there has been for everyone else because she does have this sort of link to it. I'm extremely curious to see where this goes because like personally, you guys know how much I love Nami. Like I just do. She's just my favorite. And so far, her superpower has been her competence. But if she has an actual superpower, I won't be mad at that. I would like, a, you know, a, an explanation that feels like it makes sense. Um, but I don't even like require that either. You know, it's the sort of thing where people are able to do such wild things in this world that to a point, I am not that worried about always having like a backstory as to why they can do what they can do. So I'm just, yeah, I'm really curious about that because it's specifically mentioned by Vivi, you know, and everybody is sort of like trying to determine what they should do because it's really clear Nami's very sick and she tries to play it cool and act like everything is fine and get up and walk out of bed. But like, as soon as she's outside of everybody's eye line, she's like holding onto the wall and sweating and it's just really bad. Um, I have been here before when they're, <laughs> this is one of those things that I just wish so much that somebody had told me capitalism isn't worth it. But I have had like jobs where I didn't want to let down my coworkers because they were people I really liked. And so I would try and play it cool. And I was actually really ill and it didn't always like work out. Um, and you know, eventually everybody kind of comes up to her and is like, no, seriously, go back to bed. But she doesn't want them to detour to find a doctor because she like saw this thing in the newspaper and it's about how everything has gone left in Alabasta, that the uprising, it had previously been a cold war as Vivi has said, but now there is actual fighting breaking out and she just feels like there is no time to waste I don't want to pull over anywhere and find a doctor because we have to get there as soon as we can. And all of this like makes sense to a point, but I I kept thinking, I don't see how if you die, which seems to be a genuine threat right now, Vivi says people do die due to these sorts of like sudden illnesses from the weather. If they die, they don't have a navigator, you know? Um, so I just like, I kept being like, Nami, I understand what you're saying, but also the best way to handle this is to get you to a doctor right away because you're crucial. This is like when you're doing a D and D campaign and you have your one healer in the group and something happens to them, you are screwed. And that's like when you're on a ship you lose your navigator. What the fuck are you supposed to do? You can't just go find another person to join your adventure that easily. Um, I say that all this, like thinking about the fact that she, that there isn't actually a healer in this crew at all. That's an interesting sort of oversight because that's the whole point. They're going to try and find a doctor. Um, I wonder if they'll have a doctor that officially joins their crew. Cause I would kind of like that. It does feel like that is necessary here. Um, 
so this this like winds up later on guys can i tell you something so later on they're all talking about what they should do nami is still out on the deck trying to act like she's fine and vivi comes out and is like okay if we really have to head uh, full speed ahead to Alabasta at the highest speed we can possibly go. I got so, so mad. Like, it, it's only a few minutes later that she's like, and by that, I mean, we have to heal our navigator. But at first, you just think she's completely ignoring Nami. Like, that's what that's the point of the way this is written. And it really worked. And I was so salty over it. I truly was like, Vivi, I liked you. What the fuck? Like, I was genuinely very annoyed with her. And as soon as she sort of backs up and is like, our our highest speed is whatever speed Nami gets healthy at. I was like, oh, you had me there. You really had me in the first half, not gonna lie. But uh, eventually when, and I like too, when she says that we have to go full speed ahead, Nami puts on the like fake smile and is like, well, that's what we said we would do. You know, she's trying to make the best of it. Everyone around her is like not sure how to react because you can tell they don't like this. They want to heal Nami as well. So there's just this moment of everyone looking at each other like, did this, did this bitch just say this? And she starts off by saying, I know I don't have any right to ask this of you since I'm just a guest on your ship. And then proceeds to, you know, say the thing. And I was just like, you're right. You're right. You are just a guest. I don't care that you're a princess. Go sit the fuck down. I got real mad. And then she has Nami's back after all. And I was just like, oh, yay. Thank you. Especially considering what she says lines up exactly with what I was thinking, which is like, if Nami isn't well, y'all are screwed. So that is the first thing we need to do is find a doctor for her. Because what else? Like, once they, uh, once it gets dark, they wind up just having to like all go to sleep and drop anchor and have Sanji like stay outside as guard because they literally can't navigate at all in the dark unless Nami is awake to help. So they just don't. They can't move. They don't go anywhere. I feel like that's, you know, that says it all right there. And I really do enjoy too when Nami wakes up and she sees all of them asleep. Like they're all in the room with her as if they're concerned that, you know, she's going to need something and they want to be there for her. Um, Gabriella says, Vivi's slowly gaining you over. Yeah. And, you know, like I did kind of like Vivi to begin with, like not to begin with because she was part of the uh, Team Rocket. But uh, I, w when she was joining the crew, I was kind of into her story and everything. But, you know, her personality, it's still not totally clear in a lot of ways what she's about. Um, I don't feel like she's been given a whole lot of personality beyond, like, dutiful princess who wants to do right by her people, which isn't exactly a personality. However... I just enjoy there being another woman on the crew and somebody else who is fairly serious and, and focused because we have so much zaniness and even Zoro who is serious and focused. He's asleep most of the time. Like he doesn't really bring that energy because he is not conscious. So we need people who are awake and talking to bring that energy. Um, <laughs> Florian says, Oda got you. He got us all. Um, let's see. Florian says, she is adventurous. She went with Luffy into Little Garden. Yeah. And like, th she says at that time, like, basically, I'm just going to sit here and think over all the shit that I, that could go wrong. So I'm definitely going. So that's a good point. That's like a, a part. I mean, her deciding to like join up with like the whole Baroque crew that also points to her being somebody who isn't afraid of risk, you know. Um, she's definitely brave. She tries to jump in on fights, even though she really shouldn't. Like, we have just seen her get slapped down several times now. 
I appreciate what you're trying to do there, girl, but you just aren't, you might need some more training. That's all I'm saying. Um, but I just other, like, other than that, I just don't really, you know, the, the main thing that I keep thinking about is how mad she seemed over the fact that the crew didn't seem to be like taking anything seriously. And then she is impressed when some shit begins to pop off and all of a sudden everybody is like manning their places and ready to go. And she's like, Oh, okay. You do know what you're doing, you know, because clearly she is somebody who values competence, um, which makes sense to, as to why she keeps like getting drawn to Nami. Do I ship them? I think I might ship them anyway. Um, so I'm going to back it up here a little bit to, uh, <laughs> There is this moment where they are all there. I think it's like dusk, if I'm not mistaken. Um, And oh, yeah, that's right. That's what was happening here. Because this episode ends with some guy just standing on the water. And I was like, what is going on? But before that is the uh, cyclone that shows up. And it was like they were about to be completely wrapped up in that if it weren't for the fact that Nami was able to tell them exactly where to go to dodge it. And I just find this so amazing that there's just this, there's just a cyclone and it just popped up and it was out of nowhere. And then as they get away from it, we just see the sky open and all of a sudden it starts snowing. And I didn't, I wasn't ready for the fact that Luffy is so into snow I really enjoy this, though. There's something about that that feels very right to me just because he's such a little kid in so many ways. And, um, you know, I, it's, I, I'm not sure if he has, like, ever seen snow because the climate they all seem to come from seemed to be pretty tropical. But islands can do that where it's like, you know, it's very tropical down in the shore, but then there's mountainous regions and weather can get very intense. But... My, there's a photo of my father because he was from Colombia and he was never saw snow. And there's a photo of him looking up and it's a, you know, poor quality photo when he, he must've been like maybe like 36 years old and he's looking up and smiling as snow is falling around him. The first time he ever saw it and somebody managed to snap a picture and he just looks so enchanted and it's the cutest thing. And that that just kept being what I was thinking about with Luffy. It's just like he is so excited about this. And uh, it's the sort of thing that I often think of with Owen as well. Because it's not that he's never seen snow. And certainly this past year in Texas, we had some real snow um, and ice and whatnot. But he has never been anywhere where it's like you have to dig your car out. You know, he's never like lived someplace where snow will shut shit down and it will make it so that you can't live your life, you know. And uh, I I really would like to take him somewhere where he can see what it's like to like live in because he claims to love snow. And I'm like, we'll see. <laughs> Let me take you somewhere where before you go like leave for work, you have to have an extra half hour tacked onto your get ready schedule so that you can go out and turn the car on and, you know, scrape an inch of ice off of your rear windshield without breaking the windshield. Um, but anyway, yeah, this, this snow starting, I was like, Oh shit. Cause that's a, you know, new thing here. And, um, this is when we have the, uh, Hey guys, do you think someone can stand on water? from Zorro and they look at him and they're like, what are you talking about? And he's like, what's that? And we see this dude standing on the water and he is absolutely pitiful. <sighs> I, first of all, there's a very Harlequin sort of look to him because he's like in Motley there's like a part of color thing going on, but also like a cape over it all. And he has a bow and arrow and it's not a bow 
like you're used to. This is a bow that's like the the length of a full grown adult. You know, this is the kind of bow that like Odysseus had to string to prove that he was Odysseus at the end of the Odyssey kind of thing, like a serious weapon. And that man does not look up to it. That is not the weapon that I would have assigned to him were I to guess what his weapon of choice would be. And he has this expression on his face of just like, he super doesn't want to be here. And I genuinely am like, I don't know what, what to make of this dude. So when we open up the next episode, this guy who is, he looks like he is standing on the water, it turns out, is standing on an underwater ship. Uh, and this ship is huge. It dwarfs the Going Merry. It's about the size, I would say, of like the, the restaurant ship, you know. Um, and these dudes are on the ship and attacking them before they even know what's happening. It's just like so immediate that I couldn't help but laugh because I wasn't expecting it to to be so quick. They just turn around and they're like, oh, guys are here already, you know. Um, and the the attack it's not for any it's not for any personal reason i thought it was going to be like oh it's the straw hat we've heard about you but no it turns out that what they are after is like a log pose like a an eternal pose or i think there was another one he said he he like there's this guy who's asking for um a couple different versions of it and they claim that they don't have one but this dude is just like all right fine i guess i'll just take all of your shit then because they say we don't have one and basically the the insinuation is so can you just leave us alone and i'm like mm, i don't see it that's not really how that usually goes guys and indeed this guy is like yeah, no, I'll just take all of your stuff then. That'll be good enough. And not only that, but he begins to eat their ship. And he has the creepiest mouth. Guys, I was very mistaken about what was going on here. This dude, and what is his name? Like Wapole? 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 He is... He ate a, a uh, devil fruit that allows him to eat anything. What was it? The munch munch fruit? Bite bite fruit? I don't even remember. Um, and Wapool, says Florian. Okay. Am I saying that right? Wapool or is it Wapool? <laughs> Where's the emphasis? He is, he has this mouth that has like holes over each lip, bottom and top. And he, I thought y'all that those holes, I think it's like meant to sort of represent like rivets almost because his mouth is stylized in a way that makes it look like it's made of metal, you know? But I thought the the holes were meant to be like from having had his mouth sewn shut which is a thing that has been done in history and is truly like one of the worst. I, I think about it all the time that that was like a type of punishment that was meted out, especially meted out on women, of course. And it just makes my entire skin crawl off my body. But yeah, I saw the, these holes like built into his face and I was like, is that to like fasten his mouth shut? And no, I think it's just meant to be decorative. Essentially, though, this guy starts to chow down on their ship. And this whole thing goes down so quickly. I was truly shocked. I thought this was going to be the whole next arc. And instead, it just feels like we're getting a little like teaser preview of a future villain that we're going to have to deal with. Because at like he he's on their ship but there are 
people on the main ship watching how everything progresses here. I don't know if we get names for those characters, but they are, uh, there's a guy who's dressed almost like a king because he's got a really huge cape on and everything. And essentially these dudes don't know who they're fucking with. And they think because we've got the bigger ship and we've got more people, it's no big deal. We'll be able to take them. No problem. So our guys fight back and it looks for a second, like Luffy is going to get eaten. And I love this. Wapple is like trying to chew him. And he's just like, what the hell? Cause th- this guy's really rubbery. It's weird. Um, And Luffy's arms are still outside of his mouth. So he, he stretches his arms really wide and then yanks them back and sort of, it's like a, 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 I'm trying to describe the effect here. It's like the guy was in a slingshot and he just gets flung like it looks like hundreds of miles away from the boat and all of his crew that was like, you know, watching and thinking that he was unbeatable. They are horrified at how quickly he was disposed of. And I had forgotten about the devil fruit thing, meaning that you can't swim. So they can't just like leave him to his devices and hope that he's okay. It's an immediate panic. And this gets rid of them all. And I was not expecting that. They basically are just like, remember us, we'll be back. And then we move on to the next part of the story. And I was like, okay, that surprised me. Um, And then we get another surprise. We are with Captain Smoker again. And what is her name? Uh, it started with an E, didn't it? She is, <laughs> there's this moment where she's just like so delighted with the sword that she found and is like talking about how beautiful it is. And then she trips and the sword goes flying. And I thought that the sword was going to go flying off the ship. And Tashigi, it wasn't an E. I don't know where I got that E. Thank you, Florian. I thought we were about to have like (laughs) a curb your enthusiasm sort of moment where somebody's in the midst of talking about how beautiful and wonderful something is. And then it just gets ripped out of their hands. So I thought she was like, wow, I found this amazing sword. Look at the perfect temper. And then she trips and it just flies off into the ocean, never to be seen again. And I was like, no, but instead it flies up into the air. She falls down and the sword lands point first in the deck, like an inch away from her face. And I was like, oh, Right. That seems more like the tone of this show. And it turns out that Captain Smoker overheard the transmission between Mr. Zero and Sanji, but who Mr. Zero thought was Mr. Three. And is like, so apparently they're going to be, there's going to be some trouble in Alabasta. And that is where we are going to go. And I was like, very excited about this because Captain Smoker was a weird one. I really did enjoy him. And we knew that we would see him again. Like he's, you know, they they set it up that he was following them. But the I kept thinking that it would just be like an accidental meeting on the seas. And the fact that he's going to be heading to the same place as them. And the fact that he is like a decent person. He's he's out to get them because they're pirates, but it's nothing personal for him. Makes me hope that he is going to team up with them against the actual bad guys. You know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's not how that's going to go, but I'm hopeful. Um, And I think that's about it for their little... Oh, no, no, no. Then there's the guy that they have taken prisoner. Guys, is this somebody that we have met is this the guy that was like, no, because that guy, I'm trying to think of um, the dude who like causes that weird green wind in uh, Logetown. 
that like sort of ends the whole arc there. We don't know who that is still, right? And I don't think this guy is supposed to be him, unless I'm mistaken. But this dude is lashed to the mast, and he has a, a really kind of interesting look. He's got a ruffled front to his shirt, like a 70s prom suit kind of thing. A top hat with like like a sort of leaf patterned band around it arrows drawn on his cheeks under his eyes and just there's there's a sort of look to him that makes me think of like um that oh my god the the sort of the zombie king from oh i think it's like a haitian sort of story do you guys know who i'm talking about this guy who was meant to like basically lead the undead um and he had like a top hat and was very gangly and the whole way that he was dressed looks like it's a similar era. But anyway, this dude, he's apparently been held for questioning and he's like telling them, I'm not going to tell you anything. And Captain Smoker says, what was that, uh, that letter with orders that I found in your pocket? And this guy looks panicked and says, I thought I burned that letter. And then says, that was, uh, and I love it. It turns out there wasn't anything in your pocket. So he just completely gave himself away. And yeah, don't know what his connection is to anything. But they know who Princess Vivi is also, which I thought was interesting because I th I was not expecting anybody outside of the Grand Line to be aware of who these like cities were, you know? Maybe it's that they learned it since they've come to the Grand Line because they've probably had to land on some islands and things themselves. But I do also want to know how they're navigating um, because they have like, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, here it is. Contact HQ and get an eternal pose. That's right. I forgot that he can just ask for one. So then we go back to our people and... Uh, we have the series of moments where Luffy is trying to cheer up poor Nami. None of that is working. Then eventually everybody is like, all right, it's time to find a doctor. We need to get serious about this. And Vivi comes outside and is like, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a winter island somewhere nearby. At this point, everybody is wearing heavy coats and pants, you know, parkas and shit. Luffy is still dressed as normal. And it's like been quite a while that everybody's dressed like this. And it doesn't register for him how cold it is until they are like literally pulling up to the island. And as they pull in, they suddenly notice all of these people standing on the shore and the cliffs around them. And they are not happy to see these guys at all. They yell, pirates, get the fuck out. There's this one guy who seems to be sort of in charge and he's just like, y'all are not landing here. They say something about how we need a doctor. Somebody on board our ship is really sick. And they're like, we're not falling for that. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. Because like, I kind of thought maybe that would soften their stance a little bit. But when they say we're not falling for that, I was like, oh, that that does sound like something con artists would say to try and get around. You know what I mean? Um, so I was actually a little bit impressed by that, that they were this suspicious of them. I was like, that's probably a smart attitude to take, actually. Um, and all of a sudden, shit really begins popping off with these people. It's like a, a so the dude who's like yelling at them, he's got very strong, like rugby energy to him. Um, and he is yelling like, you know, we're not letting any pirates land here. We'll blow your ship up unless you leave now. And all of a sudden things sort of go left and somebody says, don't talk back and takes a shot at, I think they're aiming for Sanji because he was the one who just talked, but they almost hit Usopp and Usopp, for his part, is like, oh, no, you fucking didn't. And he looks like he's about to do something. Like he's going to, you know, pull out his, uh, what do you call it? 
what is I keep wanting to say boomerang. Oh my God, you guys know what I'm talking about. The thing he does. But for some reason, Vivi decides that she's going to run in front of him. And I'm like, Vivi, we were just, we just talked about this, about how you have to stay alive. And she runs in front of him. And then we see her go flying. And uh, like, apparently she got shot or clipped or something. And I'm really like, y'all just shot them for talking back. That's what the guy said before he took the shot was don't talk back. What, what, what is wrong with you? Like literally what actually is wrong with you? Because that is an insane reaction. And maybe I will find out some sort of like origin for this uh, animosity and I'll see why they are feeling the way that they are about pirates in general. But that just seemed like a real fucking overreaction. And the guy who seemed to be in charge of the conversation, he is sort of yelling to the guy to not do it right before the dude pulls the trigger. So I don't think this is a sanctioned move. And I'm very uh, curious how that guy is going to react, both the one in charge and the one who pulled the trigger, because it was meant to be a warning shot. And it looks like didn't just warn them guy. So now they really need a doctor. So yeah. Um, I am a little bit bummed though, that it's a, uh, you know, now it's going to be two lady characters that both desperately need doctors, but what can you do? Um, so yeah, that's the end of the episode. It ends with Vivi like flying across the screen and it just cuts and it was very abrupt. So yeah, I'm going to wrap this one up, but thank you again, Bernadette for commissioning this. I really appreciate you. Thank you everybody in the chat for feeding me information. Appreciate you too. And I will be seeing you all again soon with a new episode until then to Lou motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.